On May 5, 1945, 27-year-old Reverend Archie Mitchell, his wife Elsie, and five children from the Christian and Missionary Alliance Church headed to the nearby mountains of Bly, Oregon for a Sunday school picnic. The Mitchells loved kids and were very involved in the youth ministry at the church. Elsie was five months pregnant and considered spending quality time with the kids excellent training for the motherhood she would soon experience. It was a beautiful spring day and the kids wanted to hike through the woods, so Elsie got out of the car to hike with them as Archie followed with the car on a nearby road. As lunchtime approached, Archie found a place to park near Leonard Creek so he could retrieve the picnic lunch they prepared. The hikers called out to Archie saying they had found something in the woods that looked like a large balloon. Archie's heart began to race as he had heard about Japanese balloon drops in the Pacific Northwest. Just as he began to shout a warning for the group to stay away from the balloon, an explosion rattled the area. The hikers had wandered across a Japanese incendiary balloon and accidentally detonated it. The force of the blast immediately filled the air with dust, pine needles, twigs, branches, and dead logs. The mangled bodies of Elsie and the children were strewn around the crater three feet wide and one foot deep. Elsie lived briefly before succumbing to her injuries. The children died instantly. They were the first and only American civilians to be killed by a balloon bomb on United States soil during World War II. Today we look at the bombing of mainland America during World War II and the Japanese weapon that is considered the first intercontinental weapon in history. A weapon that was hidden from American civilians by the United States government and could perhaps still be a ticking time bomb waiting to claim its next victim. So if you're curious, let's take a walk through history. In 1942, morale was low among the civilians of Japan. The attack on Pearl Harbor the previous year, although horrific, didn't cripple the United States Navy as planned, and the Doolittle raids on Tokyo in April had humiliated the Japanese Empire and its military. Japan was looking for revenge. It needed a way to attack America on its mainland and deflate the morale of the American people in hopes of turning the Americans against the war. But Japan had no long-range weapons to inflict damage on mainland America, especially after their Pacific Fleet losses during the Battle of Midway that June. Then, Japanese scientists came up with a plan. In 1920, Japanese researcher Wasaburo Oishi discovered a west-to-east air current on the upper atmosphere. This discovery wasn't well known at the time because Oishi published his findings in Esperanto a dialect invented in the 1880s that attempted to create a uniform international language. Japanese researchers developed a weapon that could be carried along that upper jet stream all the way to North America and attack the unprepared citizens of the U.S. and Canada. It was called Operation Fugo, incendiary bombs that would be carried along the jet stream and land in the forests of North America causing devastating fires that would cripple the Pacific Northwest. Japan had its secret mission at hand. Now it was time to draw up and develop its weapon. The balloon bomb concept was the brainchild of the Imperial Japanese Army's Noborito Laboratory. In 1933, Lieutenant General Raikichi Tada began an experimental balloon bomb program at Noborito, which proposed a hydrogen balloon 13 feet in diameter, equipped with a time fuse and capable of delivering bombs up to 70 miles. The original project was stopped by 1935, but it was brought out of mothballs for Operation Fugo. Major General Sueki Kusaba 
who had served in the original balloon bomb program under Tata, was assigned to Noborito and revived the Fugo project. By March 1943, Kusaba's team developed a 20-foot prototype capable of flying at 25,000 feet for more than 30 hours. The balloons were constructed from five thin layers of washi, a durable paper derived from the paper mulberry bush, which were glued together with Japanese potato paste. The Army mobilized thousands of teenage girls at high schools across the country to laminate and glue the sheets together, with final assembly and inflation tests at large indoor arenas, including the Nichigeki Music Hall in Tokyo. The original proposal called for night launches from submarines located 600 miles off the U.S. coast, a distance the balloons could cover in 10 hours. A timer would release the 11-pound incendiary bomb at the end of the flight. Two submarines were prepared and 200 balloons were produced by August 1943, but attack missions were postponed due to the need for submarines as weapons and food transports. Engineers next investigated the feasibility of balloon launches against the United States from the Japanese mainland, a distance of at least 6,000 miles. The Army consulted Hidetoshi Arakawa of the Central Meteorological Observatory, who used Oishi's data to extrapolate the air currents across the Pacific Ocean and estimate that a balloon released in winter and that maintained an altitude of 30,000 to 35,000 feet could reach the North American continent in 30 to 100 hours. Arakawa further found that the strongest winds blew from November to March, at speeds approaching 200 miles per hour. Hanging from the balloons by ropes was an elaborate chandelier featuring fuses, switches, batteries, and typically one high explosive bomb and two incendiary bombs. Ringing the chandelier were seven pound sandbags. Japanese engineers knew that at night, at 35,000 feet, temperatures would drop to minus 65 degrees centigrade temperatures that would cause the high-flying hydrogen balloons to begin to drop. The sandbags were ballast. When the balloons dropped below a certain height, an onboard altimeter would trigger a small charge, dropping a sandbag from the balloon. As the balloons dropped their last sandbags and neared the ground, other small flash bombs would trigger to drop the incendiary bombs and high explosive. As the last bomb was dropped, a long 64-foot fuse was also lit, leading to another flash device to destroy the balloon. In November of 1944, a Navy patrol off the coast of California spotted balloon debris in the Pacific that ultimately made its way to the FBI. As the weeks passed, more balloon fragments were found at sea. Then, in December of 1944, reports began to pop up across western U.S. of citizens finding fragments of the balloon bombs or hearing explosions. It was then that the War Department figured out what was going on and decided to censor information regarding the balloons, trying to avoid panic in the streets and deny Japanese any sort of intelligence on where and when the balloons were landing. Information that could be used to better perfect their flights on later balloon launches. American media largely adhered to the request and did not publicize the balloon findings. It's estimated that 350 of the bombs actually made it across the Pacific, and several were intercepted or shot down by the U.S. military. From 1944 to 1945, balloon bombs were spotted in more than 15 states, some as far east as Michigan and Iowa. Japanese radio propaganda trumpeted the balloon bombs as being incredibly effective and claimed they killed thousands. In truth, the balloons disrupted routines as officials chased after sightings and reports, but failed to cause the widespread fires or panic anticipated by the Japanese. Most Americans didn't find out about the balloon bombs until after the war. Oregon alone counted 45 balloon incidents, including the one that killed Elsie and the five children. In 1950, the Weyerhaeuser Timber Company built a monument at the site of the explosion. 
The Mitchell Monument is constructed of native stone and displays a bronze plaque with the names and ages of the victims of the balloon bomb explosion. Weyerhaeuser donated the monument, along with the surrounding land, to the Fremont National Forest in 1998. The monument site is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. If you were unaware of the balloon bombings, you're not alone. Although word got out especially after the war, most of the country glanced over the information as just more knowledge of a war they'd rather soon forget. And although no more balloons have been found, it doesn't mean that there aren't more balloons out there yet to be discovered after all these years. The Japanese had launched more than 9,300 balloon bombs towards the West. Only 284 were found in North America, though researchers believe perhaps a thousand made it across the Pacific. So please be vigilant as you explore this great country of ours, especially in the Pacific Northwest. And one more quick note. Operation Fugo wasn't the only time the Empire of Japan bombed the U.S. mainland. But that, my friends, is another story. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time as we explore more curious history. Take care.